first session of VCBM with the title Vascular and Flow. We have three interesting talks lined up. My name is Martin Falk and I will be chairing this session. Let's start with Analysis, a system for aneurysm data analysis given by Monique. Please, Monique, go ahead. Yeah, welcome to my talk and thanks for the nice introduction. So in this talk, I will introduce Analysis, <clears throat> a software that we developed for the visualization, classification and interactive exploration of risk criteria and treatment planning of cerebral aneurysms. The first question that arises is, what is a cerebral aneurysm? <clears throat> so here you can see a healthy cerebral vessel that bifurcates at the top. And the blood flow is indicated by these red arrows, which hit the wall at the bifurcation. And over time, a bulk on the vessel can develop at this point a so-called aneurysm. The greatest risk is that the vessel wall at the aneurysm ruptures, which leads to internal bleeding and is associated with a high rate of complications and death. Cerebral aneurysms are often discovered accidentally. So a typical scenario in everyday clinical practice looks like this. Uh, a patient with reoccurring severe headaches receives an MRI and then the radiologist at the hospital finds an aneurysm in the images. And now it must be decided if the aneurysm should be treated or not. There are various invasive and minimal invasive treatment options, but these are associated with considerable risks for the patient. And the decision whether to treat or not is essentially based on the size and the location of the aneurysm. So larger aneurysms on certain arteries are usually treated. However, these criteria do not allow a reliable assessment of the risk of rupture. And in addition, aneurysm, aneurysms rupture very rarely, but the reasons for the rupture are poorly understood and patients are afraid to live with an aneurysm. So they, um, therefore they are usually treated, although this would often not be necessary. And the ideal situation would be that only patients with a high risk of rupture should be treated with the most appropriate method. <clears throat> For research purposes, blood flow simulations are increasingly used to better understand the causes of rupture and treatment options. So rupture seems to depend on the interaction of morphological and hemodynamic properties. The basis for a simulation are clinical images with high vascular contrast. In these images, the vascular area containing the aneurysm is segmented and then a surface mesh is reconstructed. The interior of the surface mesh is then transformed into a volume which serves as input for the uh, blood flow simulation. And then the blood flow simulations result in complex data consisting of time dependent scalar, vector and tensor fields that describe the blood flow and mechanical wall behavior over the time of a heartbeat. We develop different methods to visually explore the complex aneurysm data by overcoming limitations of existing methods. So first we developed an automatic calculation of morphological parameters, such as the aneurysm size, which provides comparable results to clinical manual measurements. We also have developed techniques that allow a simultaneous exploration of multiple scalar fields on the vessel wall to identify sites at risk of rupture. In addition, we have explored techniques for a simultaneous exploration of wall and flow properties to better understand the interaction of these components. In addition, we have designed a comparative representation of tensor data showing the mechanical stresses in the vessel wall to reveal heavily loaded wall areas. Another rupture relevant factor is the complexity of blood flow within the aneurysm. 
And in order to assess the complexity objectively, we have developed a method to first cluster integral lines representing the plot flow inside the aneurysm and subsequently automatically classify the resulting flow patterns according to predefined types. All these methods were then integrated as modules into our software analysis. Analysis allows a consistent uh, administration of aneurysm data sets, which are stored in a database. So the user is guided through the exploration of the complex simulation data in order to assess the risk of rupture and, if necessary, to find an optimal treatment. When the program is started, an overview of all existing uh, data records um, existing in a database is given, as you can see here in the right image. So starting from this view, the user has several options. It is possible to search for specific cases using these filtering masks. An existing case can be explored or new data sets can be included. For new cases, first morphological properties are automatically calculated using the first module, the Moravis module. And these morphological properties are then visualized within the vessel geometry, whereby also the exact quantitative values are displayed. So the user can uh, interactively explore the individual morphological descriptors. After the morphological analysis, the user passes through further modules for exploring the various data. And an important data type here are time-dependent scalar fields, such as the pressure or the wall thickness, which are defined on the vessel wall. Because expert, experts suspect uh, rupture-relevant correlations between such scalar fields. And here the Muscovis module comes into play. It allows a simultaneous exploration of these scalar fields over the time of a heartbeat. So we have used multiple views to show different aspects of the data. The 2D plot at the bottom, um, of, in the bottom left, gives an overview of existing scalar fields over time. We also use the combination of scatter plots and histograms to show the distribution of scalar values. These views are additionally linked to a 3D view of the aneurysm. A scalar field can be color coded on the aneurysm surface. <clears throat> to allow for an unobstructed exploration, the 3D aneurysm is in addition unfolded to a 2D map where the glyphs show the temporal behavior of two user selected scalar fields. The Moscovis module was evaluated with four radiologists to assess the risk of rupture of various aneurysms with, with and without the uh, Moscovis module. So the use of the Moscovis module led to other decisions regarding the risk of rupture. The re radiologists were able to find suspicious wall regions using our methods. So smaller aneurysms, which were considered harmless, without Muscovis also showed suspicious regions. And these were the rupture sites that could be found with our Muscovis module. <clears throat> In addition to the data um, defined on the, on the vessel wall, the simu simulations provide also information on the complexity of the internal blood flow. And for the visual exploration of the flow, date, flow data inside the aneurysm, we have defined the VFLEX module. So medical studies um, have shown that different flow patterns occur in ruptured and non-ruptured aneurysms. Non-ruptured aneurysms show less complex flow patterns than ruptured cases, where a strong turbulence of the flow often occurs. Uh, for example, in the last row of this image, strong turbulence occurs in ruptured aneurysms. However, in these medical studies, the flow patterns 
uh, were manually classified, which is a quite error prone and time consuming process. Our method for the automatic classification of flow patterns consists of five main steps. So first we separate the aneurysm from the healthy vessel by automatically determining the separating area between the two structures. The blood flow inside is represented by integral lines, which are clustered in the second step to obtain flow patterns. So this means we want to have groups of similar lines. In the next step, the aneurysm is mapped to uniform structure. In this case, we used a hemisphere to avoid the influence of variations in aneurysm shape on the classification results. And thus, we are able to obtain comparable results. This is based on a developed uh, parameterization, whereby a radius and an angle is calculated for each point on the aneurysm to determine its position on the hemisphere. Afterwards, we defined flow types based on medical studies as starting point for the classification. And in the last step, each cluster is assigned to the most similar flow, flow type. For this purpose, the blood flow representing integral lines of the clusters are also projected into the hemisphere in order to determine the similarity between the clusters and the predefined types. So we used one representative line of each cluster and compare it with the predefined line inside the aneurysm representing the specific type. <clears throat> so here we see the VFLEX model applied to an aneurysm data set. So the classification results are summarized in the table, listing the three most similar flow types for each cluster. And in total, we distinguish six flow types. There are three visualization uh, options provided uh, for each cluster. So the representative line, a hull geometry, and the lines themselves. In addition, a scalar field can be color coded, such as the distance to the vessel wall. Um, and there was also a checkbox that can be used to include no new flow types for further uh, classifications. The user can select here individual clusters in 3D to explore them more precisely, where a detailed on a mount approach allows an analysis of flow patterns, even at a greater distance uh, from the camera. The 3D aneurysm view can also be linked to the hemisphere for an easier selection of groups of similar flow types. In conclusion, we uh, found out that the manual classifications to explore the relationships between flow patterns and the risk of aneurysm rupture is very time consuming and error prone. And in contrast, the VFLEX module allows an automatic classification of flow patterns based on yeah, mathematical models that we used, whereby reproducible results can be obtained, which is quite important for performing medical studies to get a deeper understanding of the influence of flow patterns on the uh, rupture risk and also on the success of an individual treatment. So our cooperating radiologists were able to explore a data set within minutes and find differences between ruptured and non-ruptured aneurysms. So in summary, analysis enables a consistent management and guided exploration of aneurysm data. So we developed five modules supporting the exploration of the complex information. Um, these include a reliable assessment of, of morphological aspects. This was the more of this module I showed you. Then we explored uh, then we developed several approaches to explore surface data, which is the 
Mosca with module and also there are two other modules that I uh, didn't show you in much detail. So you can see here that we um, also developed a module for showing tensor data, which is represented by the, by the last image in a, a second column, where we designed four yeah, glyph-based techniques to show information of tensor data, because these tensor data describe mechanical stresses inside the aneurysm walls. So here we use the commonly used super quadrix uh, for representing tensor data. Then we used kite glyphs, streamlines, and scatter plots to show the tensor main directions and also the tensor main stress values. Whereby, also, whereby the tensor data is given on the inner and the outer vessel surface. So we have two wall layers and we want to compare the tensor information on both wall layers. Um, <clears throat> and at the end, uh, we also developed an automatic classification of flow patterns where to each flow pattern, uh, one to six predefined types can be um, can be applied and the individual flow patterns can also be visualized on a 2D map um, using this yeah, circle, uh, using these circles where also a, a, um, a scalar field can be color coded on this representation. In addition, interesting results can be saved and reloaded uh, during the whole exploration. Uh, allowing a collaborative analysis with different experts. As there is currently no substantial knowledge to reliably calculate the probability of rupture, analysis helps scientists to better understand the risk of um, the risk of aneurysm rupture, and to find an optimal treatment. <clears throat> with this, I'm at the end of my talk. So. The code for the analysis, analysis modules can be found using this uh, QR code, including an exemplary aneurysm data set to test the modules. So unfortunately, I cannot upload the whole system since yeah, it is based on a huge database where I'm not allowed to give access to all data sets. So we decided to yeah, disconnect the visualization modules again from the, from the management part of analysis and to provide access to the uh, visualization models. I already uploaded uh, two modules where we will upload the remaining models within the next days because it, it needs some time to disconnect them from the uh, whole other software part. Yeah, thanks for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Monique. Um, we already have a number of questions coming in uh, via Discord. For example, uh, Michael Krone asks, when assigning the flow patterns to a flow type cluster, does your table also show the confidence for the three types you show? Yeah, it does. Um, I can go back. We uh, compute the yeah, percentage of similarity. So you get an impression of uh, how sure or unsure the the type is, and if all percentage values would be really low, then it would be an indication that it might be a good idea to add this flow pattern as a new flow type for upcoming classifications. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ingrid Hotz wonders, what are the modules that are most frequently used by the expert? And then uh, follow up on that one. Is the tool also used in practice by your partners? Um, it, it depends a little bit on their, um, on their profession. So of course, the medical experts start with the morphological analysis. And then they focused on the uh, um, exploration of, of, the, of the multiple scalar fields on the, on the vessel wall, where However, the exploration of tensor data is yeah, quite abstract for them because they are currently not quite familiar with tensor data. So 
the exploration of, of tensor data was more interesting for our CFD experts to validate their uh, simulation results. Mm -hmm. uh, so currently, uh, analysis is used for research purposes by our clinical experts in uh, Jena and uh, Danburg. So they used the tool for their uh, clinical studies or for further um, development. So they, mm -hmm. they used it, yeah. But okay. not in clinical, not, not in clinical routine, because there the bottleneck is, of course, the um, the generation of the simulation. So this is uh, mm -hmm. not so easy for, for medical uh, experts to run the simulations. Yep. But yeah, there we will also find a solution for support them in generating the simulation results. I see. Um, it seems that your framework is quite extensive. So that makes me wonder how difficult was it to integrate everything into such a single system? Yeah, so the, the system was de developed during my whole PhD time. And of course, I start each time with an individual software prototype. And after the paper was published, I integrated it into analysis. So it, mm -hmm. it was not so straightforward. It's, it was quite a lot of work. But yeah. I think it's important to have everything together for, for medical experts. And if they should use five software tools, they are not really motivated to do it. So yeah. our motivation was to give them the whole thing and then they can uh, explore everything. Yeah, I, I would assume that since you are the core developer of all these modules that simplifies things also a bit. Yeah. Good. yeah. At the moment, there um, seems not to be any more questions. So thank you again, Monique. Let's You're now welcome. switch to the next talk given by Simon Leistikov with the title Interactive Visual Similarity Analysis of Measured and Simulated Multifield Tubular Flow Ensembles. Please. Simon. Yes, thank you, Martin, for the introduction and also for reading that long name. Um, let me switch to full screen right now. Okay. Yes, so welcome everyone to my talk about this fairly long titled work. Um, actually, I, I'm very happy that um, my previous speaker, like Monique, um, yeah, already introduced some insights into flow visualization. And we will, of course, uh, are going to see some, some parallels. Um, but for now, let's start simple. Let's start with tubular flow. And uh, tubular flow can be very simple um, as lavender flow in a pipe, which you can see here. But of course, as my um, as the previous speaker, as Monique pointed out, um, tubular flow can become very complex um, quite easily, especially if some anomal uh, anomalies like the aneurysm uh, is considered. Uh, so here, for example, we see a brain aneurysm flow phantom that was, or for which data was acquired using phase contrast MRI or PCMRI for short. And for our work, we want to focus on such data or such measurements. Uh, so basically measurements that allow for non-invasive reconstruction of um, yeah, the blood flow uh, with, of, of the human body or for example, also animals. And the output then can be considered as a velocity vector field, like either time varying, but in our work, we first focus on stationary flow. But such measurement techniques um, always go along with some certain problems. Like of course noise, they have low resolution, both spatially or temporally, and might contain some artifacts such as face wraps, for example. Um, and all that goes along with long scan times for the patients. Um, and to account for that, like new acquisition techniques are being developed, um, but need to be validated against the current clinical standard. So we narrow this down to the analysis of the impact of the imaging settings um, to, to get an understanding of them. Um, as for simulated tubular flow, um, like simulation methods allow for, uh, on the one hand, like no, uh, noise-free 
um, so, um, yeah, output of an arbitrarily high resolution. Uh, and in our work, we focus on lattice Boltzmann methods. Uh, however, you can basically use any similar simulation method. There's a lot of them out there, of course. Um, but for now, to match with the measured data, we also consider the velocity vector fields. Um, for simulated data, um, the problems are of different kinds. Here we have like model assumptions. For example, the turbulence model determines how the turbulences develop over time. Um, and of course, oftentimes many parameters, many simulation or model parameters are involved. Um, and so often, so it makes sense to, to perform parameter studies to see like what the actual impact of the different um, settings used are. And to put those two things together, we want to define certain analysis scenarios. So first we are given like a lot of measurements so measured velocity vector fields and create an ensemble from them. Like these were acquired using different imaging settings. The same is true for um, simulations, but here um, we have different simulation parameters or models being used and create an ensemble from them as well. Then we firstly want to compare the measurements to see the impact of the imaging settings. We want to compare the simulations to see the impact of the simulation parameters. And lastly, we also want to compare measurements to simulations. And with that, we want to go one step further towards data simulation, which is kind of the holy grail, like by combining both domains and the best of both worlds. Um, and we would like to contribute to this field. So to, to do so, we introduce a visual computing pipeline for which I will briefly show you a small demonstration. So the segmentation might be achieved using manual labeling, of course, but we also support um, like very basic tools like uh, cropping, for example. Here you see the brain aneurysm phantom and the segmentation result is shown immediately. We also generate the center lines automatically, the, take the inflow and outflow regions. Um, and of course, you could, might smooth the geometry somehow because it's relevant for the simulation output. And every setting can also be adjusted manually, of course. And there's a lot of them. Uh, I won't go into detail. You see it on, to, on the right. Um, but basically, everything you want to adjust can be adjusted. And finally, of course, we want to generate engineered simulation ensembles that somewhat matches the measurements. So we choose ranges for the um, different parameters and draw samples from them. So that is what we are doing here. And then finally, a uh, sample of parameterizations is generated for which um, simulations can be run. And having done so, we will go to the methods to analyze them. So for our visual similarity analysis, we want to create an overview visualization because we want to be able to compare all vector fields at the, at the very same time. And to achieve that, we came up with this basically. So this is um, a plot where the dashed line represents the measurement. The simulation ones were each represented by a, a curve and you see the evolution over time. And here the vertical distance represents actually the dissimilarity. So how to achieve that? So first we need to define the dissimilarity and um, we apply dimensionality uh, reduction to create such an embedding for which we use um, multidimensional scaling or MDS for short, um, which is a distance preserving um, um, embedding technique. So, but how to define vector field? So, but how to define vector field dissimilarity? So consider those three vectors here. Um, and you might notice that those two have the same magnitude but different direction. 
the other two have the same direction but a different magnitude and um, but of course the general case is that both magnitude and direction differ so we want to focus on that and want to split these intrinsic properties of a vector um, to yeah to, to look at them separately and to find the dissimilarity separately so first for the scalar field or the magnitude um, dissimilarity we first sample the tubular flow lumen as we are not interested in any samples outside the flow lumen of course then an iso value might be defined so that for each magnitude field we can perform inside outside tests um, to then apply for example jacquard distance measure um, which basically tells us the intersection uh, or how, how much the volumes overlap um, so basically it's a fraction of the intersection of the of the union of both volumes so but actually we use um, not a simple measure there's plenty of work out there and we use a generalization to a field similarity um, that is able to give much better results and we are not um, required to pick an iso value as for the direction dissimilarity it's actually quite simple um, we choose for a given pair of two vectors we just calculate the angle between them normalize it to the range zero to one and then we define the overall dissimilarity as the mean of all normalized angles. To combine them, there's actually two scenarios we want to um, propose. So the first one is if you want to emphasize the highest dissimilarity, considering you have, for example, laminar flow, which is exactly the same in two different cases, but only the direction is different, then you can if you want to emphasize then the highest dissimilarity, just pick the highest dissimilarity. And you will see that in the, um, the case I just described, it will be evaluated to maximally dissimilar. However, if you want to equally include all dissimilarities, you can repropose to use the product of the similarities. And which one to pick depends on the analysis task. We will come to that later. So to evaluate, to evaluate this um, metric, we generated a synthetic data ensemble. Um, so it consists of three members. So the first member is only a, like a vector field where the magnitude is varied over time. So this straight line represents basically the magnitude over time starting from zero. As for the direction, we uh, create a rotating vector field and then we combine both to create vector field where if you would follow the tip of the arrow would result in a spiral like that. So first we evaluate the magnitude dissimilarity. Here we look at the eigenvalue from the embedding, eigenvalue bar chart from the embedding. And you see that the first eigenvalue is very pronounced. So it's actually sufficient to use only the first principal component over time. And we see that the direction um, data set so where only the direction differs is stays constant which is desired uh, since the magnitude doesn't change however for the magnitude data set of course starting from zero it's very dissimilar to the direction data set and it gets closer over time finally reaching it and then um, distancing itself further because the magnitude actually gets larger than that one of the direction data set as for the combined it's like very similar since also the magnitude changes. As for the direction dissimilarity, now we see that in the eigenvalue bar plot, the two uh, first two principal components are quite, quite pronounced. So um, we choose no longer to use the time as axis, but we the first two principal components. And we see that the, the um, yeah, the, the circular shape is preserved in this embedding and we only see one curve um, that is due to the combined and direction data set overlapping perfectly in this case, which is also desired. Um, the magnitude is represented by a dot only since it doesn't change. And the same would also be true in this sort of embedding like using more than one principal component if you have only a single time step because of course then it can't change over time. So now combining those two, we again look at the eigenvalue bar chart and we see that the first three principal components um, should be used to depict most of the information. And we again see 
this is the purple one still is the angular data set and it's still the angle the circular shapes preserved for the combined we see now the spiral that we would like to see and the linear transition of the magnitude data set also preserved so we see that as good starting point as for the volume visualizations to get actual like actual insights into where things things happened i won't go into detail right now because we will see it in the result part later on but we will um, provide a or we calculate standard deviation for um, a given time step so that we can see where in which regions uh, the highest limit similarity is actually um, yeah, where it actually is and we can select certain regions to create new embeddings to drill down for a pair of selected time steps uh, or vector fields, we can calculate the difference volume. Um, and of course, like streamline and path lines with the visualizations are also supported. And with that, let's just get straight to the results. So first looking at the pipe flow phantom again, here we conducted an experiment using 16 measurements where we varied the pump speeds um, and the image resolution. And you may notice the linear transition of both. So what would you expect? We will see it uh, next slide, but now we first look at the um, like where actually differences are occurring. And we see that especially at the vessel balls or at the balls of the tubes and at the in and outlets, um, we have quite big differences, which is also um, supported by the by finding the largest regions. For that, we actually like threshold the standard deviation and apply connected component analysis. Um, yeah, and actually, like for for measurements, it's it's known that they like for example, forty PCMRI measurements are known to be very sensitive in the wall regions. So, looking at the embedding, we first see so we're using two principal components. And we first see that the first principal components seem to be representing the pump speed, which can be um, seen when looking at the actual um, data points, what they are. Um, we also see a spread in the y direction. So the second principal component seems to uh, represent the image resolution. But what we also notice is that the um, difference within the group. So the spread gets wider, the higher the pump speed gets. So we pick of each group, we pick the outermost members and calculate the difference volumes and compare them for both low pump speed and high pump speed. And actually we can see that at the vessel walls here, the difference are uh, quite big in, in comparison to the low pump speed. Whereas in the region within the lumen, it's in both cases, it's quite, quite low. So this might be an indicator um, yeah, to what the image settings are sensitive to. So to sum up the findings, so that we could find that the uh, settings um, uh, could, are represented by the principal components and the areas near the flow boundaries were affected the most, which uh, as already said, is quite typical for such measurement techniques. And the higher pump speeds has had a higher impact on differences. To give a more complex example, we look again at the brain aneurysm phantom. Here we had um, a quite fun measurement with the following settings. And but this time we wanted to create a simulation ensemble and compare those to, um, to one another. So we varied the res resolution, the inflow velocity. You can see the inflow is down here we uh, varied the fluid viscosity and density. So, and the resulting embedding looks like this. We see basically like two groups. Uh, so the measurement is here in between. And we see like this group seems to contain simulation runs that were or became unstable due to low resolution when looking at the um, corresponding parameters. So you see this severe fluctuations and some of them aborted early. So what we do is we just select the ones that look nicely and like come closer to the measurement, which in our interpretation, our similarity space means they become more similar over time. And this is the resulting embedding, which you have uh, seen before. So 
yeah, we can basically see that, um, yeah, that the uh, simulation runs get closer over time, which is of course a desired property, but it might be that one needs to change more simulation, uh, or one needs to generate more simulation parameters to get closer. But now to look where the difference come from, we um, look at the regions again of highest dissimilarity, and we see especially the purple and pink region down here, which could be found to be uh, due to high uh, variation in the simulations, um, since the um, boundary conditions at the in and outlet are very sensitive towards parameter changes. Um, the green and red region, respectively, um, could be found to be due to pace wraps in the data. So we have a look at them, create a new embedding, and we see that actually the measured data, which is over here, differs more um, in comparison to the simulation runs than the simulation runs uh, yeah, to one another. So um, finally, we can remove uh, the most dissimilar regions from the from the volume from the um, observed volume, and create the yeah look at the similarity for the for the remaining volume. And we see that still at the outflow region there is quite high difference, quite high fluctuations, and in the um, like arc arc shaped uh, over here just before the aneurysm there is also high similarity, whereas in the aneurysm itself, it seems to be quite similar. Yeah, and by interacting between, so we can place a plane like this and derive a slice-based representation from it. And by interacting on the plane, we can actually like reveal the, the actual difference values uh, and see what's, what's going on in the actual uh, spatial distribution. Of course, like streamlines and pathlines can also be, be rendered. Um, and we see that still like in the aneurysm, there is, it, it looks quite smooth in the, in the simulation. So it, it might be that um, the, the measurement still contains a lot of noise, but still a simulation one could be generated that at least reassembles the flow in a similar manner. So to sum up the findings here as well, um, we could find the parameter impact um, that the yeah, low resolution caused unstable simulation. And we also could, could find that density had least impact. Uh, I, I didn't show you that um, in the images, but um, some of the points or curves did overlap. So it became clear that they have basically, are there basically similar despite the density being changed. We detected phase wraps in the measured data, and we identified the simulation on most similar to the measurement. So we also um, you know, uh, conducted or um, you know, got into contact with domain experts from the, both the CFD and MRI domain to use our tool. And the overall impression was that the, um, the CFD expert, for example, was very happy about the very um, convenient generation of simulation ensembles, for example, um, using own geometry, but also from the measured data. And the interpretation of the similarity space was found to be quite intuitive since Euclidean distances were used to represent the similarity. And the analysis approach could quickly reveal certain insights, the one that uh, I've presented before. But of course, there were certain suggestions. So. Um, the MRI experts uh, suggest to integrate also absolute similarity in the overview visualization. So because as of now it's only like relative and you uh, don't have a real feeling about what uh, dissimilarity or what uh, like what half the distance to another um, simulation run means. And of course, we already saw that visual clutter is always a problem when having a lot of simulation runs, a lot of measurements. But that uh, could be, um, if you considered, for example, clustering algorithms or similar, that could also be solved. So in conclusion, um, we generated, um, we presented a novel general scheme to compute multi-field similarity, similarity, which we use to combine scalar field and vector field similarity. We embedded this into a visual computing pipeline 
to load for segmentation and setting up simulations. And we demonstrated how the analysis tool then actually can be used to support experts from the MRI and CFD domain. As for future work, we would of course like to integrate uh, time brain measurements since we, as of right now, only used um, yeah, um, static flow. And um, also we would like to add sampling for the geometry or because the, the, the geometry might have some earth uncertainty and might influence the simulation output a lot. And we would grab the, um, the um, domain expert feedback and uh, would like to encode or incorporate the uh, absolute similarity in our similarity space embedding. Yes, and with that, I want to conclude my talk. I want to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Simon. So while we are waiting um, on some questions in Discord, I might just go ahead and um, ask you about mm -hmm. the the flow rate. You showed these four tubular flows, mm -hmm. and you only had differences visible in the outer regions, which makes me wonder why doesn't your approach pick up on the different flow rates then? The flow rate was actually the same. So, um, so basically, like we have these four tubes, and these four tubes are basically similar. And there was a pump connected to one tube, and it went all the way like one. Ah, okay. The, so, so you just circle. had four four runs then with different rates, or so. Ah, so um, yeah. The so your question is basically why the looking at the regions of highest dissimilarity could not show the different pump speeds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yeah. Well, the, the point there is since we're using the standard deviation that um, the regions at the vessel walls are like in comparison to the, mm -hmm. um, yeah, to the difference within the lumen is more, yeah, the difference is more prominent. So mm -hmm. since we use thresholding, um, that's the regions that came out um, were at the vessel walls, and of course you can adjust the threshold. So if you would put it just, I mean, if you would use a basically a very low threshold, then of course everything would be dissimilar, so to say. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah of course. You have to see what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, somewhat of follow-up question here by Ingrid Hotz. In regions with low velocity, for example, at the vessel boundary, the direction computation is less stable as regions with high velocity. Does this lead to an overestimation of the differences in such regions? Yeah, this could of course happen. Um, but since, so our general scheme basically just combines both because we use the product in our case, so it both combines both similarly. Mm -hmm. But one uh, could of course uh, think, think of um, combining them in a weighted fashion, basically. So. Um, that could solve the problem. Yeah. Okay. Then we don't seem to have any more questions. So thank you again, Simon. Okay, thank you very much. Let's now switch to the last presentation given by Florian Tam. Um, he will be talking about virtual DSA++ automated segmentation, vessel labeling, occlusion detection, and graph search on CT angiography data. Officially, this is a short paper, but since we have a bit of time available at the end of the session, um, we have decided to give Florian a bit more time. Please. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, we can already see from the title, there are a lot of features to cover. And um, I have no longer to do my best to be in time, but I'm just kidding. So let's start. <clears throat> let's start with the motivation. And with this image on the right hand side, we can already see where this journey is going to. It's about the blood vessels in our brain. To be more specific, it's about the circle of villus and its peripherals. So um, the circle of villus is um, a ring shaped vessel structure that we can easily see if we look on the brain stem and um, the circle of villus receives its blood through the basilaris and the carotis interna. 
So basically, all the blood that has to go into our brain will sooner or later end up in the circle of Willis. And the circle of Willis, um, or the job of the circle of Willis, is to distribute that blood onto the cerebral arteries, namely media, anterior, and posterior. These three candidates play a crucial role in the supply of our um, both hemispheres, and thus, if they are occluded through a clot, for instance, it can cause severe damage to the respective brain parenchyma. We know the situation better as ischemic stroke, and all these blood vessels that I presented play a crucial role in the diagnosis of um, ischemic strokes. Um, as it's hard to distinguish between a missing, a thin, or an occluded vessel on a CTA data set, it's very helpful to visualize them in the, um, or to visualize the whole cerebrovascular system. Therefore, um, I want to present um, some visualization techniques for the circle of villus and its peripherals based on CTA data. First of all, there is the digital subtraction and geography or short DSA, where we take a CTA data set and a non-contrast enhanced CT data set. We register both, subtract both, and what's left is the contrast enhanced vessel parts. Um, it gives a rather clean segmentation, but it requires a native CT scan. Then there's something I call virtual DSA, or I call sometimes also um, pseudo DSA. You take a CTA data set, you remove all the bone structures with some algorithm, and then you render with the best window you can find. And that's what I did with the image on the bottom. Um, you can see already that the, um, the overall appearance is quite noisy, and, but overall um, the vessel structures are represented. The good thing is we don't need a native scan. And, but the bad thing is we have a very noisy segmentation. The idea itself is actually quite nice, um, but the only drawback is that it, really, it gives you a very noisy segmentation. So we thought, um, why not extending this concept by introducing some more post-processing steps? And that's where virtual DSA++ comes into play, hence the name++ as an extension. So virtual DSA++ um, extends virtual DSA with a lot of post-processing steps and algorithmic and also with the labeling of the vessels. And we can already see on the image on the right hand side that the overall appearance is rather clean. And um, um, yeah, so in general, it combines basically the advantages of both left columns. We have a very clean segmentation and it requires no native scan. So let's talk about its features. Um, first of all, as I said, it leads to a segmentation and to a modeling of the cerebrovascular system and that fully automated. It can also label the cerebral arteries, cerebri anterior, media and posterior left and right, um, which is shown here with these, with these tiny markers here. In this image, we have also um, labeled the basilaris and the carotis interna, but um, as they are not that important in my project, I have neglected them for this algorithm now. Um, the next feature is um, we use the labeling to automatically detect occlusions, but how that works, I will explain later. Then there's a feature we call vein suppression, and the problem is in the visualization of the cerebrovascular system, you don't really need the whole tree. For instance, there's this bow-shaped structure here in the back of the brain, which is this part here. This is the sinus sagittalis, which is not that important in the stroke diagnosis and can be neglected. And um, it makes sense to exclude it, so we have a more and an easier and more cleaner overview of the circle of villus. To do this, an, an, asker, an, an user is asked to set a root node, um, which is here represented by this blue cube, and is further asked to set a rendering distance. Everything that is accessible within this um, walking distance is then being rendered accordingly. So for the vein suppression, the algorithm computes shortest pathways from the root node iteratively to all other nodes in the graph in this whole um, cerebrovascular system graph, basically. And it also tracks their distances to that root node. 
if a node is accessible within the set distance, it's being rendered, including the path onto it. And in this animation, the walking distance, the rendering distance was continuously increased. And thus, we see this kind of unfolding of this whole graph structure. As a byproduct of this um, graph search is um, these shortest pathways. And we can visualize these shortest pathways, which is also shown here. Um, this feature might be useful to plan mechanical thrombectomies. But I need to say that um, the root node is not quite, it does not make sense to set the root node there in the circle of Willis um, for the path planning and um, rather into the um, Carotis interna. So now it's time to, um, for a short demonstration, um, we have submitted in total three videos to the VCBM and I want to show you now the first video. Um, everything you will see was computed on an ordinary CPU. And um, the subject we will see is basically healthy, so there's no large vessel occlusion there. This demo, the demo starts with the output of the skeletonization, and um, I will clarify later what that means. And the first, the user sets a root node, and um, the whole graph search is executed, and it only took 235 milliseconds. Then we set the rendering distance to, say, 50, and let it grow interactively. And we can see that the graph is basically growing as we increase the rendering distance. This is the vein suppression. And we can now search for shortest pathways just by clicking into the desired goal point. And it's also quick. It only takes 7 to 15 milliseconds per path, as it is cached in the background. We already have done the search, and we just reuse the um, um, search results. We can um, reduce now the model to the relevant part, namely to the circle of Willis, and for example, with 100, 150 millimeters. And, um, yeah, and that's what we see now. We can replace the root node and set it somewhere else, for example, into the carotis interna. This is more the place uh, where it makes sense to plan mechanical thrombectomies, for, in for instance. And we can see immediately that the model changes because we have now a different reference point. We also see now that there are the labels. Um, the labels don't disappear with the um, vein suppression, but that's, um, um, yeah. So, um, yeah. In a, um, regarding the performance of the labeling, um, in a preliminary experiment, we figured out that the labeling works with an accuracy of 91% to 97%, but um, that's only preliminary and that must, and we have to work further on that, on this evaluation, but that will be subject of future works. So that is basically the demonstration. Um, and I will continue with the um, next slide. So let's talk about the pipeline and how it works. So every pipeline starts with some sort of input, and so does ours. The CTA data set, so in our case, the input is a CTA data set next to a brain and a vessel atlas. Um, these atlases are no, not, not binary atlases or binary masts, but rather probabilistic atlases. That means um, we have basically um, um, probabil probability values on each voxel, which represents the chance that there is actually the corresponding tissue at this position. So they are, imagine them as quite foggy and more noisy, or no, foggy is the better term for that, and they don't really delineate the brain tissue or the vessel tissue. So all these volumes are now processed in this image processing pipeline, and I will quickly explain what's going on there. So first, the CTA data set is being registered in step B with the brain atlas. Um, we use a non-rigid registration algorithm for that, and the resulting transformation is used, or the transformation field is used to transform the vessel atlas um, into the desired coordinate system. That happens in C. Um, yeah, so um, the CTA data set in parallel is also processed with a bone removal algorithm, which is based on a deep learning approach. And um, yeah, that happens in step A. So the boneless CTA data set is then filtered using the Fungi filter in step D. And the Fungi filter is, um, sorry, sorry. 
And the fungi filter is configured such that it reacts well on the vessel thicknesses that typically appear in the circle of villus. And that happens in step D. So the result of the fungi filtering is then masked out with the with a binary version of this registered um, vessel atlas. And we then binarize again this um, uh, masked out fungi result, basically. We, in step F, we apply a slice-wise half transformation on these um, yeah, funky filtering. And um, we mask out in G all the, the center points of these circles, which are located inside a vessel wall, uh, inside a, a, a vessel. Um, we don't want to have center points that are located outside of a vessel, which might happen um, in, with this half transformation. So we use these center points that are located inside a vessel to as seed points for a region growing in step H. Um, the region growing result itself is again used at seed, as seed points for another region growing in step I, which receives the boneless CTA data set basically. Then we apply some image processing onto it because the region growing is not perfect and followed by some DTF skeletonization algorithm. So the DTF skeletonization algorithm does not only skeletonize the binary mask, but also models the surface of, this, um, of, the, of the mask basically. So the labeling um, works the following way. It re reuses um, the intermediate result from an intermediate result from this pipeline, namely the result of step H. And it works the following way. So we have markers placed on the original atlas in the very first, first step. So we have there these markers, which represent the corresponding vessel sections. So we have multiple markers per vessel, basically. And then we transform, like we transformed the vessel atlas, um, we transform these markers into our desired volume and it somewhat looks like this. We have our vessel segmentation next to our markers and the markers should more or less represent the overall vessel flow. And um, for example, if like in this case, everything works fine, we have more or less represented the, um, the the markers more or less represent the um, vessel section, then we choose the closest, um, the marker which is the closest one to the vessel wall as the final marker and place the label there. Everything is fine. But as we implemented this, um, we figured out that in some cases, when we have large vessel occlusions, like in this case here, the vessel um, is missing in these cases because we don't have any contrast agent um, inside that occluded region. So the markers are more or less um, kind of alone within some radius. And we thought that is maybe the next feature. And um, we figured out that if we just look for the next closest um, vessel wall within some radius per marker, um, and if there's no vessel wall nearby, we consider this um, vessel as missing. Um, for example, it could also happen that um, because of the nature of the patient, the vessel itself does not exist because of the anatomy, but in some, in, in these uh, cerebral arteries, for example, cerebral media, these anatomical variations are super rare. I haven't ever seen a case, and the radiologists I was talking to haven't seen neither a case where a patient had no um, cerebral media. So we look for the closest vessel wall within um, for each uh, marker, and if there's nothing nearby, we consider this vessel as missing. So that was the labeling. For the graph search, we um, used the result of the DTF skeletonization, and the graph search basically lives on this graph model. So we have roots and edges, uh, so we have nodes and edges, so basically the components for a graph. Then we use short, the computation of shortest pathways um, based on the root node iteratively to all the other nodes in that graph. And then based on the writing, rendering distance or the certain interactions made by the user, we render then accordingly um, the model. So that was uh, my presentation about virtual DSA++. And thank you for the attention. And I'm happy to hear some questions.
Thank you very much, Florian. So the, the first question was asked by um, Schulz Koyer um, and is regarding is the code available for your tool? And right now it's not available, unfortunately, because the, for example, the bone removal algorithm is right now a, I would say, prototype of Siemens Healthineers. And basically, as the bone removal algorithm is crucial for the whole pipeline, the um, code is not available, mm -hmm. unfortunately. I see. Um, but I have a remedy for that and um, to replace that bone removal. Um, in the clinic, the usual clinical work workflow looks um, the following. Um, first, the uh, physicians need to identify the stroke type. Um, mm -hmm. is, it, is it hemorrhagic or is it ischemic? And what they do is usually they put the patients into the CT and make a non-contrast CT data set. So the usual workflow is that we have a non-contrast CT data set available. Mm -hmm. And um, the bone removal is basically the same as this non-contrast CT data set. So we can do a DSA data set. We can compute a DSA data set and basically start with the DSA data set from here, from this what goes into the step I, and use also these follow-up steps basically the model computation and so on. And um, so we can skip basically the bone removal too okay. with, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good. So, but then then um, they should contact you to get that part without the bone removal, I guess. Um, so right now it's not published, but yeah. I have to check that up with Siemens. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so. Okay, yeah. Uh, Lena Gundelwein is asking, you said the DTF skeletonization models the surface. Is the vessel actually represented as a surface mesh or as a center line plus inscribed radii, which are then rendered? Yeah, that's a good question. So the DTF skeletonization, first of all, computes our models for each point on the vessel section, the best or the ra the Radi radius mm -hmm. that fits best onto the actual surface. And then I have used Mavis Lab to render this. Mavis Lab makes a surface mesh out of it. So okay. what I have yeah. in the end is a mesh, but computed on on, on tiny radii, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in how long does the segmentation pipeline then take for one case? On Do you have some oh, That's a very there? good question. So the pipeline in general is fast, but the Frankie filtering, unfortunately, is the slowest one. And the overall pipeline until, so in, until the step H, uh, J basically takes around two to three minutes, but the only reason is the Frankie filtering. The Frankie filtering is configured to work on, on several scalings, which makes it, first of all, very slow. You have to consider we have to do that on a volume, which makes it even slower. And the implementation I was using was only based on CPU computation. So I'm pretty convinced that we can accelerate this just by using a GPU. And um, right now it's about two to three minutes. Okay. So when you have already the center line and the radii and you compute the shortest distances, have you thought about um, building a hierarchical model similar to um, let's say, um, distance computations on, on road maps, like you have the freeways, you have the lesser roads and so on, like building the backbone with the, the large vessels. Yes, and that's a very good point. Um, in fact, we are planning a similar thing to that. So the problem is the circle of Willis comes with a lot of anatomical variations. Mm -hmm. For example, if we look onto that last image here, there are some cases where certain key vessels are missing. For example, there are cases where the communicans anterior is missing or where the patient has a carotis interna that goes directly into the cerebrimedia without any connection to the remaining circle of Willis. And in fact, the most or the the anatomical variation that appears the most only appears in a, with a chance of 30%. So in other words, every person is unique. And before we do that, to make this hierarchical model, we have to first identify the anatomical variation. And that's not that easy. 
but it's possible if we take the graph into consideration. So that's the, the next step to do that would be to check the or to identify the anatomical variation and then to make this hierarchical model. Mm -hmm. But the problem is some of these anatomical variations are very, very rare, like one out of thousand. Um, so the the data problem is there another so yeah, the data yeah. is there another problem yeah for sure I, I was actually thinking more on um just based on the radii when when you detect thicker ves vessels um that's um has a higher likelihood of being yeah a major that's feature. a good point yeah that's a good point sometimes patients have indeed thick um vessels where it, should where where thin vessels um, are to be expected mm -hmm. so there's a kind of a yeah, yeah of course yeah yeah there's a range but in in general i think it could work as a kind of heuristic um yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good idea yes all right um thank you very much florian um at the moment we don't have any more questions so with this i would like to thank all the speakers and of course all um the audience for joining in um, and I would now like to conclude this session and point out that we now have a slightly longer break and the next keynote will then uh, commence at two o'clock.